Right, so now if anybody has any questions for the presenters during the session, please feel free to enter those into the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom room screen, and we'll address those at the end of the talk. Um, and on that note, I will go ahead and hand it over to our presenters. Thank you, Shriver. I think I will go ahead and start first. I'm Kirsten, so welcome everybody. I'm going to quickly pause and um, share my screen. I'm not a great one for multitasking, so I want to make sure I do one thing at a time. So welcome everybody. Good to see you all. And um, let's see here. What I'm going to do here is, um, so thank you very much, Shriver. He gave a wonderful um, short little bio about uh, Tammy and I. So we have been teaching a um, long time actually um, in the online education world, but much of what I say today can ha has relevance also for say the traditional, the more face-to-face um, um, -face classroom. So take what you can, hopefully you'll get um, some good little tidbits of, of fun ideas and um, inspiration from our talk. And what we're gonna share a little bit is about using digital badges, to boost confidence. Um, we teach math classes, so it can be right now, some of the ideas are specific to math, but again, this I think can be transferable to many different subject areas and content areas. And with that, we kind of like a kind of a participatory kind of uh, presentation. So um, some of you, um, if, if you would like to, um, we encourage it. There is a little QR code in the bottom right of that of our screen here. And so what I encourage you to do is uh, just to kind of start off the fun, take your mobile device, um, scan in that QR code, and um, it's a very short little form um, just to get your email and your first name. Um, and all of this information is only used right here for the next uh, 45 minutes. Um, we're not going to be saving any of it. Um, it will be deleted. So there's no worry about getting marketing emails uh, or anything like that. Um, but it's just a way to have you participate in the presentation presentation and kind of act like a student would um, in, say, an online class and how they would be receiving awards throughout their, um, their course for, for doing certain things, participating or earning certain scores. Again, so you can kind of feel that same um, boost, if you will. So uh, let me continue on here. Um, what the agenda is for the next 45 minutes, or actually now more like 40 minutes, is I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the history and the historical view of digital badges. And then also we will um, delve a little bit into what the research is saying and because we can always learn information from the research. And before Tam and I implemented these awards in our courses a year ago, um, we did look at the research to identify, well, what do we do? <laughs> We're kind of newbies at it. Um, but at the same time, we also kind of just decided to give it a try and see what happens. So, and then we will also talk about the implementation. So again, that QR code is in the bottom right um, if you didn't get it from the title slide, um, but you don't have to fill it out more than once. So, and then also please, please go ahead and ask any questions you have um, throughout. Um, I hopefully will be able to recognize them, but otherwise Tammy can kind of feel the Q&A too while I um, do a little bit of the talking. So let's do a little bit of history right i mean look at this this looks familiar i mean symbols have been used to communicate information for ages the um a badge you know that badge shape that badge has been a symbol of law enforcement to show authority um even in say the military that also we've been using badges to represent um, different honors or the rankings um, in, you know, within um, the military. Um, industry and businesses, are oftentimes using uh, badges to recognize years of service or certain milestone acknowledgements, some kind of com consumer praise. We see those often. And of course, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, I mean, that's the epitome, right? You, you recognize that sash with all the different badges to represent all the good deeds and, and wonderful skills that have been acquired. 
So there, it's, it's not necessarily a new concept, and it's an, but applied in many different settings. So why not look at it now? And even in video games, you will see my son is a 14-year-old a, a teenager, right? So he's a gamer. And so he's constantly getting different kinds of awards um, to recognize um, advancement um, within the video game. And that's just kind of a good modern day example of how badges are used. Now, we can also look at that in terms of education. And there is quite a bit of discussion on what do we do with badges, right? Um, they're, you know, electronic symbols to say document some kind of um, achievement or performance. Um, so can we use them in the educational or professional setting? And a few of the highlights of the discussion topics include, can we use them as effective pedagogical tools? Um, could they be used to uh, increase motivation? Um, would they increase the, the mastery of, of certain content? Does it um, make the learner more engaged? Or are they more likely to complete their tasks? So all of these ideas um, kind of surround how best to use digital badges. Furthermore, we can look at if badges are going to be used, what type of awards might you want to give? Would it be based on participating, just flat out participating, or would it be based on achieving some level of proficiency? Um, so some research also is showing, hey, the, the um, award system could be different in different classes or different ages or different levels of classes like lower division and upper division. Um, so is it more effective to use participatory badges in the lower division classes and more effective to use proficiency based um, awards in the upper division classes? So, you know, just we're, we're thinking through all of these these ideas relating to how, because even though badges have been around for so long, how it's actually applied in the educational setting is relatively new. And lastly, we can also consider if it's more important or if it's more effective to use the award system badges in certain disciplines. Some of the research is showing that in the STEM fields, it's easier to identify those discrete skills, and thus the awards are. Um, more sought after in those kind of fields. So just uh, kind of wanted to open up the discussion so that we can all kind of get our brains kind of wrapped around um, what we might want to do with digital badges and, and what the discussion is out there. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass on the mic to my wonderful colleague, Tammy, who's gonna kind of continue with some of the research. Thank you, Kirsten, and thank you everyone for being here today. Remember when you were a teenager and maybe you were a gamer, maybe you weren't, but odds are you had a friend who was a gamer if you were not a gamer. And think about all the hours you spent in front of the television. Now it's a computer screen, right? But the television, remember the game consoles used to hook up to a TV? We spent so much time perfecting our moods and going up levels, advancing in levels and earning different things with those games. We wanted to see if maybe there was a connection to education because if we could wrap that entire persistence and no fear of failure, and I'm gonna try until I get it right, if we could wrap all of that up and transfer it over into our courses, then I think we would hit a gold mine, gold mine. The, the first thing I wanna talk about is gamification of education. There are different views on this and in no way am I saying that we should play games the entire time. That's not what we're here for. And it would decrease our level of integrity as academic institutions. But we can take some of the positives from games and put that into our courses. There is a video, it was a TED talk, by Mark Rober and it was called the Super Mario Effect. The link to that is in our references if you would like to go watch it. I highly recommend it for several reasons. Mark Rober did several things. He created super huge uh, marshmallow guns and he made a, a hot tub filled with that melting sand, I forgot what it's called, but the, the liquid sand and just crazy things. And his goal in life 
is to teach people about science while they're having fun. They think they're having fun. They don't think they're learning anything, but boom, he hits them with the science. Whenever we watched this video, there were a couple of things that really stuck out to us. First of all, if the students are not penalized for failing, they seem to spend more time on it. Think about when you were playing a game or you watched one of your siblings play a game. Whenever all of their lives ran out, were they like, well, I guess I'm never gonna complete this. And they just turned it off after five minutes of playing. No, they learned the lessons. They were like, oh, I need to jump here. Oh, I need to avoid that. Oh, I should click here. Those are the kinds of things that we want to happen in our classes to encourage our students to keep working, that persistence. That's, that's a buzzword right now. We want to increase the persistence. Whenever we find something that's extremely challenging for students, maybe it's a specific concept, or maybe if it's a specific procedure we are asking them to complete, instead of just throwing it all out there, maybe we can think of a way to rework it to make it a little more fun. And one of the things that Mark said in his TED Talk was, we need to make sure that we're focusing on the princess and not the pits. You remember in Super Mario Brothers, the goal was to rec rescue the princess, Princess Peach, I think her name was. That was our goal. And whenever we died or we fell off or we did something incorrectly, it was like, oh, it's okay, okay, I've learned. Now I need to try again so I can go rescue the princess. A quote from Rober's TED Talk video said, by focusing on the cool end goal, the fear of failure is taken off the table and learning comes more naturally. And if we talk to our students that really struggle, especially in math classes, Kirsten and I see it a lot, they're just afraid of trying because they're afraid they're going to fail. It's that fear of failure. What we would like to get students to do is focus on the end goal, focus on the diploma, focus on that dream job. Don't stay focused on that one concept that you didn't perfect in a week. That's not gonna make or break you. What we're trying to get you to do is keep trying. And Kirsten, if you'll go ahead and go to the other slide. If I were to present these two items to you and ask you to do this, you might try it once. And if it didn't work, Eh, whatever, <laughs> I tried. But what if we kind of made the number panel look a little bit differently? So go ahead and go to the next one, Kirsten. What if we made the number panel on the left look a little bit differently? And then maybe instead of having it all boring in one color, maybe we went ahead and added some color. So that would be on the next slide. Wow, all of a sudden we've taken this task that looked not so fun. You know, why on earth am I holding buttons and pressing this button and, and learning the sequence? If we're just asking students to do things, to just perform a procedure, it's gonna be kind of boring for them. But if we put it in the context of a game, if we rework the challenge a little bit so that it's fun and they know what the end goal is, they're going to be more willing to try that fear of failure is going to be taken away. I would highly suggest you watch this video and it's in the references at the very end of the presentation because there are a whole lot of good things, a whole lot of life lessons in this video. One of the other things that he brought up at the end of the video, and it's on the next slide, is a picture. A picture, it's almost the, the expectation versus reality. That used to be a thing on Facebook, right? What I expected to happen and what really happened. It's kind of like that. When students enroll in higher education, they have this idea that, yeah, things might get a little tough, but they're kind of hoping that they just glide on through, right? They're kind of hoping that, okay, I'm going uphill a little bit. I might have to learn a little bit. I might have to sacrifice a little bit of time maybe sacrifice a little bit of family time, but I, I see that goal. But the bottom picture shows us what education, and let's face it, life is really like. We're gonna hit all kinds of obstacles. The goal is to have the persistence to get through those challenges. And another quote from his video is, challenges aren't bugs, they are features. They are features for us to get through. 
This really puts it into perspective, especially when a student is struggling. We need to help our students zoom out. We need to help them see the finish line. And by reworking some of our challenges a little bit and maybe making the class, I don't wanna say a little more fun because we're not there to necessarily have fun, but maybe just making it a, a little lighthearted that can help our students be more motivated. On the next slide, there is another TED Talk and it's by, oh, I forgot her first name, but her last name is McGonagall. McGonagall, yeah. She also talked about the gamification of education and, and I didn't agree with everything she said in the talk, but I really did like what she referred to. By the time the average 18 year old graduates from high school, they have over 10,000 hours playing one certain video game. The average high schooler has over 10,000 hours. And y'all know where that 10,000 hours comes from. There's a, a famous book and it talks about if you do something for 10,000 hours, you're an expert at it. You have mastered it. So why do these students spend so much time in these games? First off, you can be whoever you want to be in a game. And most people see their avatar in a game as the best version of themselves. Maybe you have curly hair, but you've always wanted straight hair. Guess what? In a game, your avatar can have straight hair. Maybe you are very, very tall and you, wish you weren't that tall. Guess what? In a game, you can be whatever height you wanna be. Not only in physical appearance, but also in our attributes. In a game, what are you doing in a game? You're usually on an epic quest. You are going to save the world or save a princess or save something. You are doing something awesome. You are doing something for the good of the community, either small or large. Whenever we're playing games, we see ourselves that way. We see, as, see it as the best version of ourselves. Whenever we're in those situations, we are more likely to just go ahead and get up and try it again. But if any of you guys are math teachers, you know, oftentimes we have students if they fail a problem one time, if they don't get it that one time, they give up and they say they can't do it. What we're trying to do is get the, the attitude of, I'm gonna try it again, from video games over into our math classes. And if you've ever played a game with a group of people, maybe it's one of the like World of Warcraft or something like that, then you know that you're in a group. People depend on you, you depend on other people. By playing that game, you're actually building these bonds and this trust with people you have never actually met in life. That's an advantage of a video game. On the next slide, there are just a few more things to talk about. And this is where we really took it to heart when we're talking about our courses. First of all, in that, in that class, we hope that there are a group of people that can help each other, just like in the community games. We hope there's that sense of trust and responsibility and openness and willingness to try. Also, when you're playing a video game, whatever challenge you're on, it's not impossible. It may seem impossible for just a few minutes or maybe a few attempts. It's on the verge of your capability. And that's what we want to do with our students. We want to provide them with challenges that aren't impossible but that they are going to grow when they work on. When we're in a video game and we level up, like I play Pokemon Go every day and I love it whenever I finally level up to the next level. It's the instant gratification. And we're gonna talk about that with our badges. Whenever a student does something good, they're going to get that instant gratification that, hey, I, I actually succeeded in this class and I got recognition for it. And then the last thing we see in games is the the ever-present possibility, no matter how small it is, of some just crazy out-of-this-world move that makes us win against all odds. And we're also trying to put that into our classes. Students come into our classes and they may think, this is going to be the toughest term yet. But hopefully we can use that to get them motivated because we know they can do it. And once they start to believe they can do it, that's when they get on the verge of the epic win. You may notice the QR code down here in the right-hand corner. Go ahead and scan that. As Kirsten said, we are not saving your information. 
We just want you to be able to participate. And you can also take a, a minute to go, or maybe not, I don't know, to go check your email and see if you've received anything. The YouTube link for this TED Talk is also in the comments. It's called Gaming Can Make a Better World if you just want to search for it. But the link is in the comments. All right, Kirsten, back to you. So thank you. So um, just to kind of piggyback a little bit off of what Tammy was saying is to um, recognize and to uh, to encourage and to boost some of the students in that hardest term ever, you know, taking, say, a math class. I know that um, I see that Becky and Kaylin um, here in our audience may have received a special little boost um, by scanning that QR code and filling out the form. Please, if you would check your email because we will be, I'll be sharing, well, Tammy, I think will is, has that section about sharing how, what type of awards we have been um, sharing in our classes. Um, one of which is a really random donut award. So um, Shriver, thank you, Jessica, thank you. Um, if you check your email, you will, potentially, hopefully, um, it may take a little bit of time, you will have earned your donut. So in this instance, it's merely by participating in, you know, the game of our presentation, you get a little boost by getting a donut, a virtual donut, if you will. I mean, nobody is, at least, I never feel like there's, I'm too old for a donut. So, um, as we've been talking a little bit about why to use badges or what kind of effects the, the gaming has on, on motivation, I would kind of bring it back to the positive effects of using um, awards or, or, or badges in say an educational setting. So, um, in looking through the research and, and identifying, you know, why or when or, or how we might use badges, we've, we've seen that in formal education settings that badges were encouraging engagement in learning. So that doesn't mean to say that um, they will be more willing to, or they're, they're more, they are, get higher grades, but they're more motivated to participate. So it really encourages particip participation towards that task completion. And badges also are a great way to recognize um, sort of informal learning that isn't necessarily uh, praised with a, a score or a grade from that class, but hey, maybe they're off the side also learning how to use a certain technology tool or that they've um, you know, looked at and they've, they've done some professional writing within that math class. You know, it's a way to recognize informal learning and to also be able to then transfer that to other classes, um, professional situations. Um, again, a way to um, say this has been completed, this has been achieved. Um, and something that maybe the grades or other traditional um, accolades um, don't necessarily show. Another really positive effect for using awards and badges is that it sometimes can both uh, personalize the learning and provide some personal empowerment. So if you say, hey, you have different badges or awards that can be um, earned, the, the learner, the student might say, oh, I'm really going to go for that idea. You know, I'm going to go for that skill because I really want the donut award, you know, or who knows. Um, and it provides them a more, um, it gives them you know, some control out of their learning. And that is empowerment and that is motivating in itself. Um, so um, the last item that I wanna mention as far as the, uh, you know, sort of the, the positive effects that, that could be seen from awards is that it can be able to link your educational setting with a professional setting so that it is transferable and it can be seen in the workplace as, um, oh, hey, this is a strength of this uh, employee or, you know, to be able to say, well, it's not just a, a, a grade of a B in the class. These are the skills. These are the responsibilities that we seek out. And it's recognized in the form of a digital badge or an award.
So um, the chat is super quiet. Welcome, my friends today. Um, can I get a little feedback? Has anybody received your award from the beginning or maybe that donut award? Um, from my end, it looks like you might have received an award um, and just wanted to kind of check in with you all and see um, if you did receive it and, you know, any kind of comment of like, oh, hey, you know, that's kind of, and maybe that's, um, you know, interesting or, or fun or who knows. And now again, you know, couch this within if you were in a class, I mean, now you're in, you know, a virtual presentation here, um, but uh, imagine that also that you are in, um, you know, the setting is, uh, you know, a, um, an online class and to give these kind of, um, um, you know, um, pats on the back or, or something like that. Okay, well, moving on, I think now I'm going to pass on the next little bit to my colleague Tammy um, to discuss why we even should praise and um, in the educational setting. Thank you, Kirsten. I think the chat is disabled. I think that's a that's a, just a thing. But thank you so much for everybody who's posted in the Q and A. We really appreciate it. So we've we've asked. There's there was a question in the chat just now about adult learners versus younger learners, and we're about to get to that. Just so you know, we teach adults. I think the median age of our students is maybe 33. Is that right, Kirsten? 33, 35, something like that. About, yeah. Yes. We have a lot of military students. We have a lot of um, women. We have a lot of people who have full-time jobs and families to take care of. Two-thirds of our students have a dependent at home that they're taking care of, whether it's a child or a spouse or a parent. We have adult learners, a lot of adult learners. If we have a teenager, it's a rarity. Like we call them out. Hey, <laughs> we do have adult learners. Yes. Anonymous, you're, you're saying you play Pokemon Go and you just don't want to admit it. That's fine. Um, <laughs> it's an awesome, it's an awesome game. Anyway, we, we do, I've only had one student ever say anything about, you know, this, this seems elementary or something like that. And I think that student was just more frustrated with the content of the course and not the way it was being done. So that's, that's my experience on that. And when Kirsten comes back on, she can maybe talk about that herself. And we'll show you what our awards look like here in just a second. But you may ask yourself, like, why are we praising adults? Isn't praise for kids? When you're in kindergarten, you get to do crafts and you get, you get little medals and stuff. Why are we doing that with adults? There's a lot of research to say that praise is actually very, very useful. It's <laughs> when, when the research is done, the, the variances, I mean, it, it's amazing. It is proven that if you do praise students, then they feel more connected and they will continue in your course in a, in a successful manner. So it is definitely one of those things that we can use. It's very impactful. And the reason the money is over there is because in one of the research articles that we read, Whenever you're praising a student, you're putting money into their bank. You are building up credit with that student. At the end of the course, or if they hit a particularly tough section of the course, they are more likely to come talk to you about it because you have built up value within them. It can impact students within the class. It can also impact students after they leave your classroom because you have given them that confidence. And... Praise is one of the most underused tools in our teacher tool belt. I know whenever we see adults, we think, well, you know, they earned an A. Isn't that enough? Well, for some students, it may be. And for some students, just giving them a little bit of confidence building can help them go a long way after they leave your class and they hit your, the next class that may be equally as challenging. There are two types of praise, and we'll go on to the next slide real quick. There are two main types of praise. We can praise the person because of who they are, which has nothing to do with the decisions they make. If you have done any research on growth mindset, or if you have watched any seminars or read any books on growth mindset, that's exactly what this is. We can either praise based on things that a person can't control, or we can praise on the attitude that they have. 
Maybe they tried really hard, even though they didn't make an A, maybe they tried really hard on an assignment. We can still praise that because that's actually what's gonna get them through life. That is what is going to help them conquer the challenges that are ahead. So those are the two types of praise, either the fixed traits or the effort and the strategy that they used. On the next slide, you may notice that there are basically four types of learners in our classes, and I split this into four sections. The lower left section means that a student isn't putting forth much effort and, and their grade isn't that great either. In other words, they're kind of checked out, they're doing the minimal stuff and they're not being successful. In the upper left corner, there's a, there's a lot of effort, but there's still a low grade. These are the students that I personally feel for. They are putting in the time, they are reading, they are doing their online stuff, they are asking me questions, but just something is, is not clicking and their grades aren't awesome. But on the right hand side, we have those students with high grades, whether they're putting forth a little effort or a lot of effort, they're totally rocking the course. In each of these sections, we can still praise the students in these sections. And the next slide shows how we can do that. For the students who aren't putting forth much effort and their grade shows it in the bottom left, these badges, these awards can actually help motivate them to maybe spend more time in the course when they see, oh, oh, I did that and I got something. Okay, maybe I'll do something else. For the students in the top left who are putting forth all of the effort, they're spending hours in the class, but their grade is just not where they want it to be. We can help them by encouraging them to persevere. We can give them that little boost that will help them continue instead of giving up. Because you never know, at the end of the course, they could totally earn enough points to pass. Then on the right-hand side, those high grade earners, sometimes they're overlooked. Sometimes we think, well, isn't the grade an award in, in itself? Maybe, maybe not, but we can definitely encourage them. For the students who are doing really, really well, just because they maybe already know the material, maybe the badges will help them to dig deeper. They'll say, oh, this is kind of cool. Maybe I'll, I'll spend some more time in the reading and try to learn something new. For the top right-hand corner, wow, the students who are working hard and it's paying off, we can definitely reward them for their hard work and they will appreciate it because they think, does she know I'm working this hard? Yeah, we know you're working that hard and we can say thank you for it. Just to recap a little bit then on the next slide, for the, for the badges, for these awards, are we gonna base it on a skill? Maybe they made a B on their homework. Maybe they made an A on their homework. Or are we gonna base it on participation? We have weekly seminars. So maybe we give out an award just because they've attended the seminar. For some students, that's kind of hard to do, especially with all the other things they have in their life that are going on. So how do we want to base the awards? And then also, do we want to base it on their abilities? Maybe that good job, you earned an A on this and you did fantastic, keep it up. Or maybe it's an award that will motivate them. It, it's one of those that, it's a keep working hard badge. It's a keep working hard award. On the next slide, we'll, we'll talk about some of the types of badges that, that we created. We created some just for attempting assignments, even if it wasn't a perfect score, even if it wasn't an A, even if they didn't pass, we're just like, hey, thank you for getting in there and trying this assignment. Like mentioned before, we can give out awards for attendance in our seminars. We have discussion boards. We give out awards or badges whenever students post on the discussion board. There's even an award, we use Brightspace by DTOL, that's our LMS. And there is actually an award already in there if a student clicks on every single content item. So we put that in there because who knows who's gonna do that. And then also for submitting certain assignments, we go ahead and submit awards. And you may notice the QR code down there. So that's a different one, right, Kirsten? It's Kirsten's turn anyway, but I think that's a different one. So you can go ahead and click on that. And I'll let Kirsten wrap us up. 
And so the idea with this was um, if the chat was open, but you can put your, your comments in the Q and A is, um, you know, what type of awards might you want to be given, giving in, in your courses? And so I know that there's already response. Um, uh, Gaytree, um, uh, shoot, uh, hold on one second. I think, let me go back to that. Um, posted a note, you know, well, what type of specific badges would work for teaching calculus for different audiences? And, you know, you're looking at your, your I, I can, I can hear the question of, well, how do we match up the awards with what we have, with the, with the people we have, with the students we have, with the content area we have, with the, the level of course that we have? So um, we were hoping to get, you know, some comments from, from the audience. And if you did post, then go ahead and you can uh, click on or, or uh, scan that QR code because you could earn another award just by thinking and engaging and thinking about what type of awards that you might um, be interested in, in sharing. So let me um, also as a way to uh, motivate the, the, um, the, the thinking is what we have done. So I think I have a few minutes left here to talk about that. And of course, then we'll have an open discussion for Q&A. Um, but um, so, so Tammy and I, about a year ago, we teach, um, uh, we are course leads for two sort of beginning level classes, a survey of math class and a college algebra class, which are typically then prerequisites for many of the programs within our school. So um, that kind of sets the stage as well for what the, um, who we have. We do not have math majors. We do not have students that are, are you know, going for that pure math degree. So we, um, definitely like to be creative in recognizing um, achievements in the class. And so there are a few different types of um, awards that we decided to do. When we were initially setting this up, we just kind of jumped in and says, hey, you know, we know there's a lot of discussion about awards. I'm not really sure. We've never really done this before. I'm going to um, use, um, I'm just going to give some awards based on the participation, some awards based on some achievement that they make, some on the grades, um, some for just clicking on this, some for completing it, those kind of things. And when we step back and we looked, we like, oh my gosh, actually we have about half and half. We have half of our awards are participatory based and half of them are proficiency based. So it was like, okay, well, that's kind of cool. And you know, we'll be going through an analysis of it after a full year of working with the awards. Um, but Becky does have a note, I wanted to recognize that, that you use badges named after the Bloom's um, taxonomy verbs. That's fantastic, that's a great idea. Um, you know, to recognize the, the higher levels of thinking and to say, hey, this is where you're at. That's awesome, I love that. Um, and uh, Anonymous, you has, I have a great comment. You don't seem to understand how to get my random award without scanning the character. It looks like I really <laughs> want the badge here. So, um, in the class, they would be initiating, they would, um, well, here, let me dive into an example and that probably will explain your comment. So uh, for the very first week, if um, we have an award for the right foot. So if, if um, a student completes, submits um, every assignment, we have three assignments for, or three or four assignments for that first week, then it would be recognized and they would realize, oh, they didn't get a zero. They've, they've tried every single assignment. And we did some research actually in these classes that um, shows that if a student does um, complete every assignment, not necessarily gets 100%, but has no zeros for any of the assignments in the whole course, which is something to be proud of, they will not fail. They, they might get a, a D, um, but 98% of them actually got a C or higher. So again, a way to motivate. So we can send out a, an award just by saying, hey, you're starting off on the right foot. You are attempting every assignment. 
And by doing that, then it will trigger the email to be sent out and also a little badge to show up in the course when the student is logged in. So hopefully that answers that question of, you know, I'm not sure how to trigger without scanning the QR code. Most of the time with the students by completing their assignment for that right foot award, they will automatically get that, um, get that award. The, if they happen to get 100% of the homework for that first unit, which is, um, you know, something we want to encourage and strive for because the, the software that we use allows for repeated attempts at, at different problems in the math class. So we want to encourage perseverance by really getting every problem right. We have an award for the 100% club. And Tammy's been phenomenal about naming these awards with just something kind of a fun little flavor about them. You know, so it's the right foot club or right foot award, the 100% club, you know, just a way to uh, to recognize it in a in a in a lighthearted way, I guess. Um, Catherine has a note. Do you have any lessons, uh, mishaps from your implementation process? Oh, absolutely. So I will get to that for sure, because, you know, we just jumped right in and we thought, well, hey, let's just try this and see what happens and see the reactions uh, from our students. And um, I would say the majority of our students responded um, with a lot of praise. They're like, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, so these are a few examples here. Um, there's another set of examples. As we move forward throughout the term, we have a 10-week term. So say in the third unit or the third week, if they, again, are continuing to complete every assignment, we give them a thumbs up award. Um, and um, or if we try to, we try to set uh, an award, at least one award for every week of the 10-week term. And so, for example, in, in unit six, we attached a, a skills-based uh, a proficiency award. If the student earned over 80% on that quiz, we really wanna say, hey, we wanna recognize that because not only are they working, they, they doing the assignments, but they're also working, they're striving to get um, a, a high grade. And that shows that you know, they are learning along the way. Um, I randomly gave out the donut award in unit seven because I needed something to do. Again, that was a participatory thing, whereas if they completed every assignment, they would get um, a donut. You know, kind of fun in unit seven. And there's also we have um, a discussion board that requires you to work together as a group project, which is not necessarily um, something that my students really seek out, especially online, but um, it is part of our program and also um, when you step back and, and look at this as a, prof uh, a professional uh, program. To be able to work together virtually um, and professionally is a skill that um, definitely is sought by the employers. So we have an assignment related to that, and we also recognize that with the award. So, um, and um, anonymous, you have a note about we do we do lessons in Hawks. We do have some classes that use Hawks. For the classes that I'm mentioning here, um, the they are not based in the Hawks software. Um, but um, but Brightspace knows of 100% is achieved because whatever third party, whether we're using My Math Lab or McGraw Hill or if we're using Hawks, it will feed back into Brightspace, and then Brightspace recognizes that and sent and triggers the award. So yeah, um, and but but Hawks is is well known for using badges within their software um, or you know, award systems, mastery style um, of, um, of uh, notification of, you know, quality work. So yeah, um, and uh, yeah, so you can get very creative and the awards, um, at least the, the LMS we use is D2L, is Brightspace by D2L. So it gives some options to have little um, icons that are pre-made within the LMS. You can create them yourself. Like I created the donut one. And um, I think um, the ones before this, uh, the right foot, the 100% club, I designed those myself. There's um, a website that is very simple to use. And I'd be happy to share that um, in the chat if anybody's interested. Um, but um, yeah, so it's, it's a minimal amount of effort on the part of the 
instructor or even designer. Um, and then once it's set up, you know, you just use it again. And, and because it's, you know, using an um, automated system, an intelligent um, um, system, you don't, the instructor isn't, isn't the one that is um, activating that. And so that also is very efficient use of, you know, the instructors, um, the time. Um, and so, yeah. Um, I think that is about it, except I, I want to just touch on a little bit the student comments and then I'm going to come back to um, one of the comments in the chats about the missteps and lessons learned. As I mentioned, the majority of the comments that we've received from the students are positive. They're like, oh my goodness, that's kind of fun. Like just um, a, a surprise motivation because they didn't really expect to get, you know, these colorful badges like you get in Scouts um, in a math, an online math class. So um, one of my favorite comments um, actually came from one of the instructors that uh, was using the badges um, with the college algebra class and the, the student commented, who do I have to kidnap, kidnap to get another badge? Because they, they had gotten them in the like, first couple of weeks of the course and they hadn't gotten them in a while. And, and they're kind of like, well, what, what do I need to do? Um, so it was, it was neat that they were actually checking back at that. Um, and we get a lot of students also that haven't um, taken and haven't quote done math in a long time. They haven't been in school for a while um, and they're coming back and they have so much anxiety ar around taking this one or two math classes for the degree program um, and doing it in an online fashion. So it was it also was the fact that, oh, even they can be motivated by these little badges. So as, as this one comment that a student has, as small as this may sound, I really enjoyed the sticker widget awards. Every time I would achieve a 90% or higher, I would get a pop up saying congratulations for getting a, a 90 or higher on the assignment. I mean, you know, it's just the online world is a little isolated, you know, it's virtual and we're not there at, to give that feedback as a teacher probably would to the students is, you know, handing out your, your paper that has a, you know, the score on top and, and looking them in their eyes and says, hey, really nice job. This is a way that we can um, a, a little bit of a substitute. And the bottom right corner, you see a little um, um, example of when a student logs in, they can see the awards that they have earned along the way in the term. So um, I think that is all I have to mention. Oh, what I, what I was going to comment on the, the missteps um, or the lessons learned, but I think that's all we have. I want to just kind of bring up the reference slide because it also has the TED Talks that Tammy had mentioned. And Tammy, if you want to um, comment at all, please feel free to. The one thing I was going to say, Catherine, is that I have gotten uh, some of my students, sometimes they, you know, they get several badges and there is kind of a balance I think um, and and we're playing around with that of giving too many badges or giving too few I we like to have at least one opportunity over the for the 10 weeks to for a student to earn the badge but again you know it's like the the trophy um, syndrome these days and where all the kids are getting trophies for everybody for everything that they do. I mean, my my child, I remember it had um, by the time that they were eight, I think they had like eight trophies, you know, one for a piano contest, one for, you know, going to actually a party at the like a birthday party at the soccer field. They everybody at the party got a trophy, you know, it was like it kind of diminishes the um, the effect of getting this you know trophy. So there's a little bit of a balance to be found between um, you know how many badges to provide and what type of badges and stuff and, and we're learning. All right, the only thing, I know we're running out of time. We are out of time, but I just want to say yes on making sure you don't overload the students with badges. Totally agree with that. And then um, how often do we talk about badges? Personally, in my classes, I don't mention it, but I know some instructors mention it because what happens is when they log into our LMS, it pops up. So they know they get one. And we also have it set up to where they get an email whenever they've earned the first one. So they know what to look for. So I don't talk about it, but I know that 
um, other instructors mention them. Hey, you know, did anybody earn a badge this week or something like that? So that the students who haven't earned one yet will be like, wait a minute, what? And it will increase interest in the badges. And I'm just gonna go ahead and say, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. I hope it was beneficial. If you have any questions, please holler at us and we'll be happy to help. Thank you all for sitting through and hopefully you've uh, earned that survival award by surviving our 50 minute talk. This is great. Thank you both so much. So um, it does look like we are out of time, a little over, but that's no problem. So I'll say and once again, thank you both for all the valuable information that you shared. Um, that was great. And I love the Mario references of a gamer. So that was fantastic. Um, so while accessing the conference website, everyone, please do not forget to swing by the exhibit hall to say hello to the entire Hawks team. Um, if you view a quick five minute demonstration, I will be entered to win our hourly giveaways, which are your choice of a six month subscription to Audible, a one year subscription to Disney Plus, or a $100 Amazon gift card. So please go by because those are some awesome giveaways. Um, and we'll be seeing you all at our next session. And I will mention really quickly for everyone in this room, we do not have a, se a session here for the next hour. Um, you can hang out if you want, but it'll be very lonely until two. So um, really